I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Good morning. This is Jonathan Small, host and producer of All About You, and this program is broadcast every single week at AccessTV.org studios in downtown Hartford. And All About You is a show that's designed to give my guests a chance to give their life story. This morning on All About You, I have a very successful individual with an extensive background, and we're going to obviously talk about his life, what he's been through, what his future plans consist of. This morning, my guest on All About You is retired Superior Court Judge Clarence Jones. Good morning, Clarence. Good morning. How, you doing? How are you? I'm doing fine. And you? Fine, thank you. Okay. Uh, Clarence Jones, you was born technically in Cleveland, Ohio, but you was raised in Montgomery, Alabama. Yes. Um, I, my mother died in childbirth. Mm -hmm. uh, so my birthday is on her tombstone. Okay. Uh, which is which is a challenge at around, uh, you know, happy birthday time. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, my grandmother then came from Montgomery, Alabama, mm -hmm. when I was about four months old, and got me and brought me and raised me in Montgomery. Okay, uh, what was it like growing up in Montgomery, Alabama? Well, uh, as long as you stayed in the black community, mm -hmm. uh, you were very supported, and people, uh, all the neighbors, want you to say hello as you walk down the neighborhood, right? Walk, walk down the street, and they looked after you. But if you left the black neighborhood, uh, you were in some jeopardy. Mm -hmm. If you get into the white section of the of the uh, city at about the time when I was raised down there, mm -hmm. what was the conditions like in the black community where you was raised at in Alabama? Uh, a lot of dirt roads, mm -hmm. uh, some shotgun houses, oh, and boy. they call them shotgun because if you open the front door and and uh, let off a shotgun, the the bullets would go through the house and exit out the back door, mm -hmm. and with no no stops in between. Right, uh, but it was a very uh, Religious. I was raised in a very religious environment by my grandmother. She mm. was Southern Baptist, hard shell Southern Baptist. Okay. Baptist born, Baptist uh, bred, Baptist till I die kind of Baptist. Yes. And so it was a w warm church experience. It was a good childhood. Mm -hmm. Now Montgomery, during the time that you was raised in Montgomery, Alabama, this was during the Civil Rights era. Yes. Uh, Rosa Parks decided one day that she would not get off the bus or give her a seat to a white person. Mm -hmm. And that started the Montgomery bus boycott. Now, how old were you when that actually took place? I was 12 years 12 old. 12 years old, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So what ha what was it like growing up into segregation where you couldn't go into one part of the city, you couldn't go into another part of different areas? What was that like yeah. for you? Um, again, uh, we sort of re retreated to our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But for example, as, as you say, there are places you could not go. Yes. For example, uh, you couldn't sit in city parks. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't go to city swimming pools. Mm -hmm. You couldn't even walk inside the park. Okay. And that was illegal. And of course, they had the colored only and whites only um, water fountains mm -hmm. downtown. And if you were you were black, if you went into a clothing store, uh, they wouldn't let you try on the clothes mm -hmm. because white people would, didn't have to try on those same clothes. Okay. So it was it was something to get used to. Mm -hmm. Did you participate in any particular civil rights moments when you was a resident uh, in Montgomery, Alabama? Uh, of course, uh, I went to the various church meetings of, of the Montgomery Improvement Association mm -hmm. that organized the, uh, the the bus boycott and helped to carry that out with Dr. Martin Luther King. Okay, uh, I went to a lot of those meetings and arranged at churches at night. I also, um, years later, uh, joined the marches from Selma, Alabama. Mm -hmm. they, they marched into Montgomery, and I joined them in Montgomery. We marched from my high school outside, near the city limits, into downtown Montgomery. Okay. There were just thousands of people on that march. Mm -hmm. Now, you were able to meet Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr.? I didn't technically meet him. Mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of uh, being in churches where he preached. Okay. And then I remember a sp specific incident where um, he was preaching and, and Reverend Abernathy, his associate, mm -hmm. uh, was also present. And we there were a lot of people in this church. Uh, it's a huge church. Mm -hmm. And uh, we began to smell some tear gas. 
mm-hmm. coming into the church. Mm-hmm. The church was full of people. Yes. Um, and um, Reverend Abernathy said, don't worry. Don't t- told us to, to not worry. If we believe in Jesus, we need to lean into his everlasting arms and that he would protect us. Mm-hmm. And he said, and by the way, Dr. King is downstairs now talking to Robert Kennedy, mm-hmm. the Attorney General of the United States, about getting us home. Okay. And so that's how we got home. Mm-hmm. Now, Montgomery, Alabama, that's uh, not that far from Birmingham, Alabama. Is it a It's about 90 miles. 90 miles. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, when the four girls was killed in the bombing in Birmingham, Alabama, did you kind of feel it in Montgomery? I mean, did you feel like it, this could happen to where I live at? Of that, course. Okay. Of course. In fact, Dr. King's home, as I recall, doc, there was a bomb threat on Dr. King's home mm-hmm. uh, during the time when he was there. He was pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist, no, the Dix, the um, uh, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church mm-hmm. in Montgomery on the main thoroughfare going up to the state capitol. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever get to the point, Clarence Jones, that you say, like a lot of people during that time, you want to escape the South and come up North or go to other parts of the country? Well, I went to, I went to undergraduate school at Tuskegee University, Tuskegee Institute at at the time, Mm -hmm. now Tuskegee University. And when I graduated from there, from Tuskegee, Alabama, Mm -hmm. uh, I went, came downtown to try to find a job. I I remember going to the bus station there and being told that I was overqualified. Okay. So I decided to leave Montgomery to, to, uh, move my career ahead. Mm-hmm. But I went into law because I wanted to see how the system works mm-hmm. and what access it provided to ad- address some of the wrongdoings in society. Mm-hmm. Was it easy or difficult for you to be able to get into college and to go on to a law school during that time period for yourself? Yeah, I don't know in what way. Well, I mean, was it, I mean, was it, for you to go to college and for you to go to law school, was that kind of the norm or was that something rare for black people oh, during that time I to be able to ad- advance? Sure. During the time, the thinking was if you want to get ahead, education was the way to get ahead. Okay. And so my grandmother and, and put into my head the idea that if you want to succeed, if you want to get away from all this racism and segregation mm-hmm. uh, and the disadvantages that went with that, Mm-hmm. You need to get an education. So she assisted me in uh, getting to to college, and she uh, paid the tuition. And I worked. I did work study. I worked all the time that I was in college and in law school. Mm-hmm. Now I know you had Thurgood Marshall as one of the high uh, black judges, probably during that era, maybe a little bit afterwards. Mm-hmm. But did you kind of perceive yourself that this could be very difficult for me to become a judge or was it something that you looked at it that is a challenge that I could be able to overcome? Because you really didn't have that many black judges mm-hmm. during that time period. Did you or did you not? You mean judges here in Connecticut? Um, well, yes, I, I would even say here judge, in yeah, Connecticut because right, right. this is where you actually came to. Right, right, okay. right. Um, well, uh, I think there were seven judges of color Mm-hmm. when I made an application to become a Superior Court judge. Okay. And so I'm, I may become number eight. Number eight, <laughs> all right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which time era did you come to uh, Connecticut? I came to Connecticut in 1968. Okay. And I worked for New Haven Legal Assistance Association. I graduated from Howard Law School mm-hmm. uh, and was recruited to come to New Haven and I received a uh, fellowship, Regional Hebrew Smith Fellowship mm-hmm. uh, for lawyers who were interested in working in the civil rights, not civil rights, but in the uh, legal aid business. Mm -hmm. Now, when you came to Connecticut into the New Haven area, did you find yourself um, experiencing a whole different standard of uh, living or a different lifestyle here comparable to the South at that same time period? Uh, I had been in Washington, D.C. I went to Washington, D.C., so that was a transition period. Okay. So I had acclimated to the Northern way of life. Right. But as you mentioned that, it was interesting to me because in the South, you're supposed to say hello to people as they pass you by. Yes. And in the North, if you say hello mm-hmm. to people, people look askance at you. Right. Or okay. you, you can see them looking at you before you get to them. Uh-huh. And then they turn their eyes away as soon as you get that close okay. um, as, you, as you're about to pass them. Mm-hmm. And I found, found that just unsettling. Right. It took a while to get adjusted to that. Now, you mentioned you was born in Cleveland. Did mm-hmm. you go up to Cleveland as a child? No. As a child, so you did 
No. So you never went back to Cleveland no. and brought up as a child. Okay. No. No. So again, the transition from Washington, D.C. to the North was really your base experience yes. coming right. up here. Right. Um, 1968 was a very turmoil year with Dr. Martin Luther King being assassinated. Did you experience a lot of the social unrest that was going on in our cities in New Haven? When I when Dr. King uh, was killed, I was a student at the law school at Howard University Law School. I mm -hmm. think I was my I think it was my junior year, mm -hmm. and I remember the riots break, breaking out mm -hmm. uh, because I could you can look out your window. I lived on about the fourth floor of this apartment complex. Okay, and saw bricks hitting police cars and uh, the looting of the of a large chain of uh, grocery stores mm -hmm. in my area. Mm -hmm. and so that was very disturbing. Mm. Um, what did you try to do? I mean, beyond just you being a judge, did you try to get involved in any community activism levels in that time era, in that time era? Uh, I was, let's see, I came to New Haven and I, became a lawyer with New Haven Legal Assistance Association. I was there for about uh, five years. Mm -hmm. And then I left there and became associate director of this organization, it's a civil rights organization mm -hmm. called the Center for Advocacy Research and Planning. Mm -hmm. It initially was named NAACP Center for Advocacy Research and Planning yes. in New Haven. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became a lawyer with them and I brought lawsuits uh, seeking racial justice. Mm -hmm. One was against the New Haven Police Department uh, to uh, provide equal opportunity for hiring, promotions, and discipline of minority officers. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we won that lawsuit through a consent decree. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the union joined us in, in formulating that consent decree. And it also included uh, white women as a, as a class to be protected in, in the police department. Okay. I also was a lawyer in the case against uh, in housing discrimination. We mm -hmm. brought some, I brought some, uh, on behalf of the organization, I brought, uh, litigation against a major housing um, agency. Mm -hmm. And and we fought um, discrimination in this in the way that that particular agency steered whites to white neighborhoods and blacks to black neighborhoods who were buying homes or interested in buying homes. Mm -hmm. We sent out testers to test to see what the agents would would uh, they would respond based upon the race of the applicant mm -hmm. or the potential applicant. And then we brought lawsuits. Okay. So it sounds like to me, uh, Clarence, that even though this is the North uh, in this era, that there was still a lot of serious uh, inequities that existed in oh, New Haven, Connecticut. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Was that even a little bit more shocking to you? Because you had, did you have the belief that up North was going to be so much different or better? I thought so. Okay. And I was disillusioned. Disillusioned. <laughs> all right. Yes. Um, did you say you had covered a lot of different areas as a judge in Connecticut? Mm -hmm. um, you were one of eight blacks, you said, at that particular time. I think there were about eight of us. Eight of us, okay. Mm -hmm. Did you face any racisms? Uh, not, to my, not to my knowledge. I remember, not from the agency, not from the state, mm -hmm. uh, the state agencies. I remember walking downtown in Milford when I was assigned to Milford mm -hmm. uh, at, at lunchtime. Right. with a suit on mm -hmm. and a bunch of white kids yelling nigger 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 oh get see. off the street nigger uh -huh. and, and that was disturbing but it, i let it pass oh okay mm. well i mean i gotta be honest i mean i don't I, maybe you might have been used to that in the south a little bit so you think that played a role why it didn't really bother you or? i think so okay you think mm -hmm. so okay mm -hmm. i'll see through that mm -hmm. do you ever look at your life and say how different your life would have been had you been raised in Cleveland, Ohio, instead of Montgomery, Alabama? No, I really haven't given that much thought. Okay. I was very fortunate to have been raised by my father's mother, mm -hmm. who was a hard shell Baptist. Okay. And so I was in church a lot, yes. you know, Sunday through the weekends almost. Right. Uh, and also during the week would go to church service. So I was raised not to, not to hate people. Mm -hmm. I was raised to accept all people, mm -hmm. regardless of their race. Mm-hmm. So you have no regrets. I mean, that's really the question oh, I no. wanted to ask you no, about no. your life. No. To do that. No. Um, have you have, do you have any family in Cleveland, Ohio? I think you mentioned your brother lives in Cleveland. Uh, no, he lives in Montgomery. Oh, Montgomery. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you um, well, do you have any family in Cleveland, Ohio? Uh, let's see. 
No. Okay. Mm-hmm. No. No. And I know you are a resident of Connecticut, and you also have a home in Florida. Well, we, we my wife and I live in two places. We live uh, in we live in Sarasota, Florida. Yes. And we also live in in Connecticut. That's a tremendous success story just right there. I mean, you're a very blessed man to be able to come from where you came from in Montgomery, Alabama, to where you are today. Mm. And I find that very encouraging. We're going to come right back very shortly with part two of All About You. We're going to get into your book that you just written, Triumphant, and get into some more of your life story. And I'm finding this life story very interesting and encouraging at the same time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, This is Jonathan Small. I am hosting All About You this morning with my guest, retired Superior Court Judge Clarence Jones. We're going to come back very shortly with part two of All About You. Thank you. These are the monsters of the road. Ever drive alongside a tractor trailer in the rain? Scary. You're hoping they don't change lines. Now they see you, now they don't. This monster can crush you in an instant. It may be insured for millions, but you're not thinking of that in a dangerous situation. I'm attorney Jeffrey Dresden. Have an accident, you know it to be. Because this is what we do. 24-7, 11-22. Summer is almost here, and it's not too early to start thinking about summer programs and activities for your child. They are important for all children, so they won't lose what they learn during the school year over the summer. This way, they will be ready for the first day of school in the fall. And make sure you plan your summer vacation for the days after summer school ends, right before the new school year begins. Remember, learning happens every day. Good morning again. This is Jonathan Small. I'm hosting All About You this morning with my guest, retired Superior Court Judge Clarence Jones. We're going to get back with part two of All About You. Clarence, first of all, the question is, how do you become a Superior Court Judge is the question I would like to Uh, ask you. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, You you actually fill out an application saying, I want to be a a Superior Court Judge. Uh Uh-huh. And you submit that application to some agency known as the the uh, Judicial Selection Commission, mm-hmm. which is, consists of about 12 individuals, 12 people, mo- six of whom are lawyers and six of whom are not lawyers, but are business people and, and uh, significant other people. Okay. Uh, you submit yourself for an interview to them, mm-hmm. and they decide whether or not you are qualified to become a judge. Mm-hmm. If, you are, if they decide you're qualified, I think it's a seven to five vote at least, uh, then your name goes on a list of mm-hmm. people who are eligible to be a chosen as Superior Court Judge. Mm-hmm. And when an opening comes up on the court, the governor mu- is restricted to that list and can decide anyone on that list to be the next Superior Court Judge. Yes. And if the judge, if the governor chooses your name, the governor then submits that name to the state legislature, to the state house and the state senate. There's a committee, joint committee of the house and senate, judiciary committee that holds a publicized hearing on you. Mm-hmm. And then if you pass that, um, the House and the Senate can vote you in as a Superior Court judge, mm-hmm. and you come up for, for renomination every eight years. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this one of the highest levels of judges that we have in our country? Uh, there are three three levels. There's 
superior court judge, which is the trial court judge. Okay. Um, and above them, there were at least 150, 160 superior court judges mm -hmm. across the state, mm -hmm. various courthouses. And above them is a group called the, uh, a, uh, the judiciary called the appellate court. Mm -hmm. And that court uh, then decides whether or not the trial court judges have made any errors in handling cases. Mm -hmm. And above them is the Supreme Court of Connecticut. And that group of judges decides, justices, decide whether or not the appellate court has made any mistakes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so you now are a retired mm -hmm. superior court judge. Yes. Um, if the idea, because I look at a lot of um, talk shows sometimes, I don't look at them, but I know that they exist, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, would you ever consider if a TV show came to you and said they would like to hire you to be a superior court judge? Would that interest you? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that would get you out of our retirement. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Judge. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm also working. I, I'm, I do immigration, not immigration, I, um, uh, arbitration, arbitration cases, cases yes. mediation cases. Mediation. Okay. And uh, I, I'm also a uh, lawyer for a law firm called Cronin and Shields mm. in Guilford, Connecticut. So I'm off counsel to them and also handle cases on their behalf. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you work a typical um, full-time schedule or do you kind of balance it out? It's, it's, it's part-time. Part-time, okay. Mm -hmm. So you still like to stay active in Absolutely. the professional world. Right. Um, and you spend some time in your home in Florida as well? Yes, the winters particularly. The winters, okay. Right. right. So. Well, well most, of the, most of the year is spent there. Like, oh, okay. Uh, yes. Are you considering um, officially moving to Florida or are you going to continue to stay here in Connecticut? Um, uh, my wife and I are discussing how we're going to handle this okay. right now. So that's a big decision to right. some degree. Right. All right. This book that you basically has um, written, Triumph, it, how did that come about? Triumph? Triumph. Uh, you it's can take a, a look at it. Oh, thanks. Okay. It's a... Uh, self-published novel, mm -hmm. which chronicles, which is inspired by the cases that I presided over when I was a Superior Court judge, okay. including cases in uh, juvenile court mm -hmm. and also um, the uh, family court. Mm -hmm. um, what gave you the idea to want to write this particular book? Is something inside you that just wanted you to get this information well, out? I also wanted to, to allow the readers to see it, get an insight and view of what the juvenile court is like. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a confidential court designed to protect the, the, the confidentiality of youth mm -hmm. and their families as they go, go through these difficult and trying times in their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a court that provides a lot of resources to families uh, who are in crisis. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to give an insider's view of what goes on in that court. Mm -hmm. And so the reader gets to see the court, how the court operates through the eyes of the trial judge. Yes. Uh, as a retired Superior Court judge, you work criminal and civil cases? Or did you... Uh, you well, I, I handle... You handle, I mean. Right, I handle civil, and uh, housing, okay, juvenile, divorce, mm -hmm. criminal. Criminal cases. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the juvenile system, and I know you came to New Haven in the late 60s. And you must have some, by you being a judge in New Haven and... That's one particular urban city. Do you see it kind of disturbing in this era that we still have major problems in the juvenile systems and the criminal justice systems, particularly with black and um, Hispanic men yes. in our society? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm heartened that people are beginning to take a look at how to fix it. Okay. Uh, I understand that the governor has a special task force that's produced some proposals for uh, reducing some of the disparities in treatment mm -hmm. in uh, incarcerated facilities. Mm -hmm. um, here, the, the president of the United States has also come out, came out yesterday at the NAACP meeting, mm -hmm. uh, proposing ways of re reducing the disparities between uh, black and white persons who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Do you think everybody in society deserve a second chance, maybe a third and fourth chances? I mean, what's your view as a judge seeing a lot of cases come through your courtroom in the past? Do you think people really deserve a second chance in society? Especially if they're nonviolent. Okay. If they're nonviolent offenders. Um, the court has an obligation to not only deal with uh, the 
the individual before it, if, if it's a defendant, criminal defendant, mm -hmm. the court also has an obligation to protect society. Mm -hmm. And we, in fulfilling that obligation, sometimes we have to lock up violent criminals. Mm -hmm. Now, now, excuse me, as your uh, life in the past growing up in a different era of racial segregation and, you know, the turmoil, what that was like in the 50s and the 60s, and then to see that we have advanced so far in this country, but yet we still have a lot of disturbing incidents that still takes place mm -hmm. in our in our country, even like the nine people that was killed in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, do you think we still have to fight for civil rights even today? Oh, absolutely. Okay. absolutely, 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 mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, but do you think we need to do it the same way, like marching and protesting comparable to the past, or we need to do it a um, different way? Well, I, I, we can have an integrated approach, oh. quote, quote unquote, okay. uh, depending upon the circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, mar the marches surely bring attention. And we have a, in this country a right to associate, a right to assemble, mm -hmm. a right to speak out, speak mm -hmm. truth to power, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, and it, it's a coordinated effort that uh, generally produces a very good result. Mm -hmm. um, you grew up under an era of racial segregation. Mm -hmm. um, we have an integrated society today. Do you feel we're better off having um, an integrated society overall, comparable to what we had in the past when you was growing up? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Right. But, I, but sometimes I hear the argument, Clarence uh, Jones, that we gave up um in the black communities and particularly a lot of businesses that we used to own comparable once we had integration that we don't own much uh businesses and the things that we used to have mm -hmm. is that a legitimate issue or problem that you think we still have in our society well i really haven't studied the the, the issue um, mm -hmm. i do remember being in Montgomery, alabama that there were grocery stores that were owned by black people mm -hmm. um, insurance companies Yes, that were owned by black people, mm -hmm. um, and since those barriers have been removed, I'm not quite sure what the percentages are now. Mm -hmm. uh, do you still have somewhat of a community activism within you today? Do you still believe you have to fight or address certain issues that needs to be addressed? I would like to volunteer to, to help out in the situations okay. where I can be effective. Right. right. I f still feel a need to do that sort of thing. Uh huh. Um, you have a home in Sarasota, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that's something that you are blessed to have through your hard work and what you've had to go through to get to that point? That could be an example for maybe a lot of other people coming along that there's a way through education or hard work that mm -hmm. you can really advance and make something of yourself? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And also with the help of my family, you know, my, my wife and, mm -hmm. and my family. So the family structure also plays Absolutely. a very Absolutely. important role. Absolutely. Uh, Clarence, what is going to be some of your future plans in the future that you're going to be looking towards? Well, uh, I'm working on a second novel right now uh -huh. that deals with domestic violence. Right. And so I hope to get that out by December mm -hmm. and to continue my work with uh, mediation and arbitration. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned domestic violence. Um, that probably wasn't a serious problem when you first became um a judge or do you or was that a serious problem well, i think it was a serious it problem, was a serious problem mm -hmm. then? okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um what do you would like to be able to address towards domestic violence i mean what do you think needs to be kind of done to kind of remedy this problem the education of young people mm -hmm. and the education of uh young males mm -hmm. to to uh, incorporate within them a, a sense that they have no right to physically abuse another person mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also families, to, to have families understand that the importance of, of, of uh, supporting that concept. Mm -hmm. um, do you think today we have a better overall society of opportunities and advancement comparable to what we had maybe 50 years ago? Oh, absolutely. You, okay. Absolutely. All right. Mm -hmm. um, sometime when you look at the news and, you know, I know I... This show is taped in the capital city of, of Hartford, mm -hmm. um, but we are kind of like an urban city and you used to work in New Haven as an urban city. Mm -hmm. What is still some of the challenges that you think urban cities are still facing today that needs to be uh, done 
differently, per, you know, comparable to what we are doing. We have a lot of serious um, issues in our urban cities here in Connecticut and throughout our country. What do you think we need to be able to do to kind of fix some of these problems? Well, gun violence. Right. Uh, we, we need to address the issue of gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, mentoring programs for kids in school. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably bring some religious aspect into the training of the of the kids. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a fair argument because I've had ministers on this show in the past, mm -hmm. and the faith base was very instrumental in the civil rights era that you grew up in. Absolutely. Right. But I'm hearing today, and this could be constructive criticism or I could be wrong, that the faith-based initiatives really are not involved in many issues comparable to the way they were in the past. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a reality or do you think there are more faith-based initiatives uh, that's doing more than what they get credit for? See, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I wish I could answer that. But you, I don't know. you don't know that. All but right. I, I just remember when I was being raised, mm -hmm. uh, we, we were, I was raised in a neighborhood basically of people who went to church mm -hmm. and people in the neighborhood who went to church. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be because there was very little else you can do to entertain yourself except go to church. Right, right. But the argument is um, Clarence, retired superior to our judge, Clarence uh, Jones. We have a lot of churches in our inner cities. It's not that we don't have the physical structure of a, of a church. Mm -hmm. And some of your most troublesome issues and violence is taking place right next door, right in the same area of a church. Um, is it somewhat of a kind of disrespect level or just some type of um, breakdown? I mean, I can give you my uh, opinion, but I want to hear it from you. Mm -hmm. Why that in an era that you grew up in, do you feel that people had more of a sense of of a respect for the church oh, yeah, and, and the pastor? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and, and and the church movement galvanized the civil rights movement. Right. 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 Um, but the people also went to church in those neighborhoods. Okay. So I don't know how many people go to church in the neighborhoods where the churches are now. Yes. Um, they have other options to, to do to get entertainment or mm. an expression of themselves outside of those churches. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about outreach by churches, I assume. Yes, yes. And uh, I mean, do the do the people in those neighborhoods go to church? Well, if you look at some of the churches, um, it looks like it's more women in churches, females in churches than men. Mm -hmm. And the major problem that you're having with high unemployment, um, gun violence, you know, the criminal justice systems is really plaguing men in these communities. Mm -hmm. And I think the men are not in the church, uh, the, at least the ones that's in serious trouble, but, but they're not connected. I think even beyond just saying you're in a church, they're not really connected to a higher spirituality. Because mm -hmm. I think if you have a higher spirituality and you have a love for yourself, you wouldn't want to kill somebody else. Right. So I think it's a complex issue and a mm -hmm. complex problem. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, the time when you came up to Connecticut after Martin Luther King was assassinated, right. did you sense that we were still not able to correct a lot of problems that's kind of leading us to where we are um, today? Mm. As I think back to my childhood and, and my time in Montgomery, uh, I remember that there was very little crime. You could leave your doors unlocked. Mm -hmm. um, no one would come into your house and steal things from you. Mm -hmm. And that existed until the interstate came through Montgomery, Alabama, okay. which also was a, provided a uh, opportunity for drugs to come into Montgomery, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Then people started locking their doors. Right. So, so the, the drug issue created a problem in our neighborhoods, I think. Mm -hmm. So today, Montgomery, Alabama, where you was raised that they have the same urban decayed problems that we have throughout our country? Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and certain pockets of the name of the city, yes. Mm -hmm. Is it still a segregated city, uh, Montgomery? Uh, to some extent, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But but you can, you know, there are different laws now. You can you, you can call upon the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department to say, I want that house. Right. And if, the, if the guy doesn't sell it to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Would you ever consider um, 
moving or having a second or third home in Montgomery, yeah. Alabama. Okay, you know, you don't have no interest in wanting to go back to. Well, I, I, I like the city. Uh -huh. I like the people there. Right. The family there. Right. Uh, and, and, so, and I love the people there. Yes. But that would be one house too many. Oh, okay, <laughs> that's true. Two is a good amount to have. Um, what kind of would like to be your legacy that you want people to remember Clarence Jones of, of, of your life? Uh, that I've tried to, to help people uh -huh. along the way. Right. Um, you have anything else you want to say about your life or about your book that you want people to know before we end this uh, show? Oh, thank you. It's at Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble, okay. <laughs> and Amazon. Uh -huh. You can order it there. Uh, you can also um, order it as a... Uh, um, a, an ebook or hard copy. Okay. And you are also working on the second book you mentioned. Yes, I am. And I hope to get that done by December. Uh huh. Okay. Well, it was a tremendous honor having you on as a retired Superior Court judge. I think I learned some things about your life and what you've been through. I hope the viewers out there was able to learn some things about. Uh, your life, and I think you seem to be a person that people can look at all people uh, as a tremendous uh, successful individual who went through some tremendous challenges and issues and to let people know that you can reach your destiny or your full potential. That's just the view that I have of yourself um, this morning. Just Thank meeting you. you. You're, very, you're very kind. Thank uh, you. Okay. It was a pleasure having you on here Same this morning. Here. Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you. All right, this is Jonathan Small. I had enjoyed hosting All About You this morning with my guest, retired Superior Court Judge Clarence Jones. And there's a lot of great programs you could always look at on accesstv.org network throughout the week. There may even be a new program popping up time to time. And as I say to you every single week out there, have a, have a very blessed day and keep the faith. Thank you.